I'd forgotten and wasn't expecting to be reminded of of uh, Gardener's World. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I sent my own video in. Monty Don did not visit, sadly. Um, right. I'll just share my screen, um, and I hope that everyone can see these and also maybe some videos along at the same time. Um, so yeah, Bertie's sort of alluded to and, and covered um, in that I was a colleague with Bertie at the University of Liverpool. Um, and then uh, when I was um, uh, doing this work, I was working as a research fellow at the University of Salford. And I'm actually now uh, back in uh, planning practice working in community engagement. So I feel like I'm moonlighting as an academic for the afternoon um, and also moonlighting as a historian because I trained as a planner um, and a, a geographer. So please um, bear that in mind <laughs> uh, when I present to you some history, which <laughs> I feel uh, like a slight sham. And I should also say that this is based on a paper that I wrote, uh, co-authored with um, Dr. Bertie Dockrell, who you all know well. So um, also kind of some, uh, you know, shared responsibility and thanks to Bertie for inviting me and writing this with me. Um, oh, skipping ahead before I'm ready. So I realised um, that I provided very loose slash no information <laughs> on what the title and subject of my talk was going to be apart from Bertie knowing vaguely what the paper was about because he wrote it. So, um, uh, so I apologise that you haven't had much uh, of a blurb to go on, but thank you for taking a punt on the talk anyway. Um, and I think the title does capture it so that hopefully there are no, no shocks um, in that we will be talking about uh, uh, municipal parks in uh, between in both Manchester and Salford. Um, because I can't get out of the habit of being uh, a, a lecturer in a former life, I've done an overview for us. So that's what I hope to cover. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how we started thinking about this paper um, and uh, what we actually did because I'm a planner and so I still write things like methods chapters, which Bertie tells me is quite unusual. Uh, and then we'll get to the real kind of um, the important parts. So we'll talk about the creation of, in this case, Peel Park, which is the focus uh, of our talk. And then it's recreation sometime later. Um, and then I'll try and bring some of that together with some kind of final thoughts um, and possibly some uh, bonus material um, if we've got time, or at least some pointers to some other material if you're interested. Um, and in the background, there is a picture of modern day uh, Peel Park, actually. With, people in enjoying um, a, a kickabout. Oh, and because again, I'm a planner, I like a map, I thought I'd better show you where we are. I I'm suspect that as an audience, you're potentially familiar, but this is the location of Peel Park in Salford, which is um, the focus of, of our work. Um, and if you need a kind of, um, orienting in uh, Greater Manchester, you've got Salford Crescent Station just to the southwest, and Manchester City Centre just uh, sort of off to the southeast of this map here. So my starting point, as I mentioned, I was a lecturer in planning at the University of Liverpool, and I taught and developed a module called Green Infrastructure, um, and as planners, this is a term that we often use to describe all of the vegetation in typically our kind of urban um, ecosystems. So it can be everything from street trees to roadside verges um, and neighborhood playgrounds, all the way up to some of our grandest um, public parks and everything in between. And its aim for planners as a, as a concept or term is to foster the idea that our green spaces need to be connected or thought of as a network in order to function best. And also to level up, to use a kind of modern day phrase, the green spaces to the same kind of status as other infrastructure networks like communications or, or transport. Um, 
there's a, a definition um, that's commonly used. That's actually from uh, some American authors, um, but it highlights the interconnected network of natural um, and other open spaces, um, conserving ecosystem values, functions, um, and supporting people and wildlife. So as part of this process, I delivered a lecture in that module called The History of Green Infrastructure. Um, and it was actually audaciously titled The Antecedents of Green Infrastructure, um, which is an inherited title that I didn't come up with necessarily. And the story that that lecture told about the history of green infrastructure often pieced together snippets from the US and from British park creation in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, including, uh, for example, covering um, the grandfather of American landscape architecture, Friedrich Law Olmsted, who um, borrowed from the British landscape and Parkland uh, heavyweight capability Brown to create some of America's most famous public parks, notably Prospect Park in Brooklyn uh, and Central Park in New York, as well as others in uh, Boston um, and... Oh, there you go, that's it. I've, I've lost my how many examples of, of Friedrich Law Armsteads I can come up with. And that history would then often hop back over the pond to talk about um, uh, garden cities in the UK and, and Ebenezer Howard. Even if we take a slightly closer uh, look at this history, which I did with the help of Bertie, to look at the, the, more, the historical story of public parks in the UK, um, it's often presented as a response to increasing industrialization, leading to the establishment of public walks and public parks. And public parks in particular um, offered ideas of providing large sanitary lungs um, for cities to prevent uh, miasma and disease and uh, epidemics. Again, maybe some parallels already emerging um, with contemporary uh, rhetoric around green spaces. Um, and also notions of the civilizing and improving uh, kind of potential for the working classes through rational recreation. So the, the spaces themselves providing not a uh, space for idleness, but for the undertaking of uh, improving exercise such as cricket, archery, uh, perhaps even an afternoon concert. Um, and also in some instances, parks were used as a mechanism to improve the land value um, surrounding prospective new pr prospective housing developments. So again, perhaps another parallel with today. Um, crucially though, for our story, um, and I guess a kind of precursor to where we actually kick off is that the Select Committee on Public Walks reported in 1833, raising their concerns of overcrowding, poverty, squalor, ill health, lack of morals and morale. And they called for the creation of public parks in Britain's urban centres. So there are, though, a number of problems with my telling of that history in the lecture that I created. Um, and I suspect many of you will be familiar with some of the kind of um, the, uh, the problems I've created or the, the looseness of that story that I pulled together. Um, and know more of the detail than I do. But for me, there were two important things that I wanted to explore more um, after having peddled that story for years in a, in a um, lecture series. So firstly, is that the history that I told is very Anglophone centric. So obviously, um, the US and the UK stories are kind of interlinked. We know that Olmsted did visit Birkenhead, for example, um, in thinking about uh, Central Park. Um, however, we weren't the only ones kind of building cities and, and parks did appear elsewhere. So at the very least, we need to remember that this is only one history of public parks. Um, and I've tried to explore that in some, uh, some other work, uh, another paper that is um, not yet available, sadly, on the Mexican perspectives of, um, and it's testing my Spanish, Infraestructura Verde, right, which is terrible pronunciation, but green infrastructure in Mexico. But that's, I guess, for another, another time. The second thing I wanted to know more was whether parks, um, and today they're seen often as green infrastructure assets, which are some of the most valuable or productive parts of our green infrastructure network, 
um, and they are assigned a list of uh, potential services or benefits and functions, you know, as long as your arm, whether our increasingly complex and kind of lofty aspirations for what these parts can deliver is a new phenomenon or something that can be traced back a little further. So effectively, I wanted to ask the question, how did we get here with public parks? What were the ideas behind the first parks? And how does that trace on to today's public park um, offerings? So and at some point in formulating those questions, I moved from the University of Liverpool to Salford. Um, and for those of you who are fortunate enough to be familiar with the University of Salford, Peel Park became a daily place that I visited um, as the university is literally built on top of a good portion of the southern section of the historic park. Um, and so I was neighbours with Peel Park uh, prior to the pandemic for some time. So in order to explore this question and by a mix of academic rigour and happenstance, I found myself in Salford uh, Local History Library perusing the records of one of the first park superintendents for Salford. And you can see his notes uh, here on the, the screen from 1885, where he is reporting back to the Public Parks Committee on the, uh, the ongoing works and management uh, of Salford's uh, fledgling public parks. And at this point, I can tell you that there was a lot of bench painting and a good deal of sheep wrangling uh, in order to keep the, the parks nicely uh, uh, moan. So his records, sadly, uh, as beautiful as they are, don't actually cover the formation of the park. So for this work, we went back slightly further to the less romantic records of the public parks committees <laughs> and the general committees of Manchester and Salford corporations um, and other newspaper articles. So that's how we kind of got to where we're going. This is the bit I couldn't resist because I, I felt obliged to show you some methods. We phrased some research questions as I've already kind of outlined. Um, and we wanted to use and take a kind of historical perspective to look at that idea of whether, how we think about everything we've attached onto the public parks, has it grown or is it quite a modern kind of set of aspirations and particularly to focus on some of the social and community motivations and the financing of public parks. Um, and to do this, we've drawn together rather than a continuous history, which would be substantial for Peel Park, um, which uh, opened in 1846. What we've done is taken two distinct time periods, um, one in the 1840s around the time of its creation, and one in the 2010s around the time of its major refurbishment. Um, and so we're kind of drawing looking back and forth between these two time periods. So, okay, we're not doing too bad. I was worried I'd be terrible for time because I didn't properly time myself, but <laughs> I think we're okay so far. Famous last words. Um, so the creation of, of Peel Park. Um, Peel Park was one of three public parks opened in Manchester in 1846. Um, um, one of the first touch points between the 1840s and today is perhaps the confusing and slightly sensitive relationship uh, boundaries between Manchester and Salford. So when the Manchester Corporation, responding to the Select Committee on Public Walks in 1833, had called for the establishment of public parks, when they're uh, undertaking to establish their own series of public parks, one of the sites they purchased was in fact in Salford. So from the get-go, we've got some boundary hopping. It was relatively quickly smoothed over in that Salford Corporation agreed to um, take on the park when it was complete. Um, so that, that kind of boundary issue um, was relatively easily resolved. Um, but what we learned very quickly from the records around 1846, um, is that newspaper records highlight the importance of the opening uh, ceremony and the opening of the park, the establishment of the park itself. We have quite um, uh, fruity reports of a cavalcade of horse-drawn carriages and coaches accompanied by two regimental bands processing from Manchester Town Hall to Salford Town Hall. 
Uh, there was a considerable reception of Salford's civic elite, including policemen and the fire brigades. Um, and this was a substantial event uh, that happened around um, Peel Park first, but then continued on to the other two parks, which were opening that same day. Um, across the border in Manchester, what's now Phillips and Queen's Park. Um, after these on-site festivities, uh, they were followed by a 5,000 strong meeting at the Free Trade Hall in Manchester. Uh, and for anyone who's um, keen on their Free Trade Hall history, I wonder if a 5,000 strong meeting is another example of a Free Trade Hall concert that vastly outstrips the capacity of the building itself. I, I couldn't possibly say. Uh, but there's a, uh, I think, a Dylan reference, if anyone's <laughs> up on, on their free trade hall history. So, so there's a big um, kind of, you know, party and celebration, and it's well received, the establishment of this park. So despite such civic celebration and trumpeting by both Salford and Manchester corporations, neither had actually contributed financially to the establishment of the park. Although it's fair to say they did support the creation and, and gave impetus for their creation, particularly Manchester Mayor uh, Alexander Kay, who convened on the 8th of August 1844, um, what he called a public meeting of the gentry, bankers, merchants and traders of Manchester to consider the propriety of taking steps for the formation of a public park, walk or playground. So he's responding to the select committee's report. Um, ahead of that meeting, we learned that two £1,000 donations uh, were already noted from Sir Benjamin Hayward and Mark Phillips MP, um, after who Phillips Park, one of the sister parks, is named. Um, and we also had letters of support by other notable men uh, being read out. Um, overall, we hear that the thrust of their support for the establishment of these parks um, was around the primary beneficiaries of public parks being the working classes. And the Reverend Canon C.D. Ray wrote, um, it was desirable that the working classes should have spaces of ground found for them where they may be able to take moderate exercise and find relaxation from their daily toil. So by the end of this meeting, 7,000 pounds has been pledged by the sort of nobles and gentry of uh, Manchester. Uh, agreement has been uh, made that Manchester needs at least two public parks. We know they eventually purchased three sites. Uh, and they create a list of 25 names who are selected to be to form a group outside of the council to be responsible for delivering these new parks. Um, as none of the kind of council infrastructure in terms of committees at this point properly exists for the management of parks. So it's sort of delegated to this group who are a mixture of um, sort of, you know, uh, gentry and council um, uh, bods anyway. So by the, uh, so it's resolved to, that once these sites are purchased and laid out as parks, that they would then be conveyed over to the mayor, aldermen and burgesses of the borough uh, and their successors. Um, on the understanding that they would be um, free for use and enjoyment of the inhabitants in perpetuity and that they would be kept in good order and repair. So they've established the kind of conditions of trust that these three sites and that this fund uh, that's raised will purchase and lay out and the, the conditions of trust that they will be handed over to the, um, in this case, the two boroughs, both Salford and Manchester. The sort of laissez-faire funding uh, approach and the paternalistic and self-improving rhetoric is typical of the time. Um, and we see not only the great and the good uh, donating, but also appeals to the working classes themselves to contribute to the funds. And what they call a working class meeting is held on the 10th of September, 1844, uh, which the opening remarks outline the attempts to get what we would call buy-in in my kind of current employment uh, from the working classes for public parks. Uh, so the remarks begin to open the meeting. They say, every woman who finds herself, her children's sport restricted by the smallness of her house and their health deteriorated by continual habitation of crowded streets and who loves her offspring and wishes them to live 
should move herself and induce her husband to move in support of the establishment of free public parks, for they will excite the mind to action by supplying instructive and pleasing lessons in science, will moralise by association of class and the gen generation of sympathy between them. I mean, there's probably a whole other paper about the kind of politics and gender politics of that statement. Um, but broadly speaking for us, we can say that that approach to appeal to the working classes uh, worked. We see that 5,000 people attended this meeting and raised a further 19,112 pounds and 13 shillings, by which point the, the fund had grown sufficiently over its first year to be able to purchase sites. And the fund was closed exactly one year after opening in 1845. And the first site purchased was uh, then known as the Lark Hill Estate in Salford, followed by its neighboring uh, uh, wellness estate, um, in total some 32 acres. So that's what becomes Peel Park, these two adjoining estates. Um, ahead of this agreed uh, transfer over to the Salford Corporation in this case, um, and as I say, this had been agreed by this point that Salford would take on rather than Manchester, um, under the same terms agreed at the first um, meeting of the gentry, um, the committee began furnishing the park with the necessary improving equipment. Uh, so Peel Park itself was laid out with playgrounds, um, a flat area for cricket and other manly games, and an outdoor gymnasium, which included horizontal beams, climbing ladders, climbing board, slanting and parallel poles, German ropes, um, and Bertie's going, <laughs> correct me, and the giant strides. <coughs> Um, sadly, or perhaps predictably, insufficient funds meant that the equipment for the ball games themselves was uh, was not available, and the uh, Salford or Manchester Corporation had not um, deemed it feasible or possible to contribute any funds until they had ownership of the parks. So they ran out of money, effectively to to quite finish the parks, but they laid them out um, uh, in relatively good order uh, within a year. Um, so beyond the planned uh, rational recreational activities, other improving activities provided for included concerts um, and the labelling of tree species to awaken attention and give information to many of the humbler classes. Uh, there was also a wide carriageway encompassing the site and a series of tiered parterres that gave fine views of the River Irwell, uh, where boats could be hired as well. Um, all of this not only sought to improve the lot of working classes, as we heard in the opening remarks, but also encouraged some notion of a, uh, what they called a democratic space, where members of all classes might, in Mark Phillips's words, meet on a footing of perfect equality. So, I mean, democratic or not, in the 1840s, what is clear from Salford's first public park is that it was incredibly popular. Reporting on its census of park usage for the week ending 30th of July 1847, so that's one year after opening, Salford Borough Council's uh, Park Committee's annual report noted that the total uh, of 30,000 and 69 people had visited the park during that week alone. And they remarked that that week was considered a typical week for the season. So summarising uh, the park and its opening, Mark Phillips MP said, the people's park raised by the people and for the use of the people. So this certainly seems to have come to fruition in that they have created a park that is held in trust funded by public subscription and is free to use, unlike previous iterations that might have included a, a gate key subscription, um, and as we see was proved popular with the public. So by 1847, everything is uh, going smoothly. The park is popular. Some of the materials are laid down. If we jump ahead 170 or so years, uh, brings us to the more recent refurbishment of Peel Park or the recreation. I can move on as well. Look, 
that's the historic map, I should say, of the 1890 layout, I believe, um, of Peel Park. And you can see it's um, uh, wider than your, uh, it's got more sort of width, particularly the top, which is the Woolmis estate, um, than it currently has. And it goes right up to what is now the, the Crescent, or what is was the Crescent is now the A6 in Salford. So it's more extensive. Um, than it is now, but you can see some of the features um, uh, laid out there. And they have a really lovely copy of this in Salford Local History Library. They kindly uh, allow me to use the digital version. Um, this is the much less romantic uh, PDF copy of the uh, planner's drawing of the refurbished park. <laughs> um, but to the recreation. Um, so in a similar vein to the reopening of the park, um, the 13th of October 2017, the park reopened from its refurbishment and was marked with an event called the Fire Garden, uh, where the park was decked out with fire displays and lanterns. Um, and similarly, although in a much, much smaller scale, an official opening was held later in May 2018. Um, unlike the 1840s, however, the media record is somewhat more scant, uh, although both Facebook and Twitter do show reverberations of the opening events, and there is some local reporting uh, offered by the Manchester Evening News, although it is kind of tangential as part of a what's on section for that summer season, or for the uh, Halloween season, I think it was. So both uh, kind of provided with an opening event, but perhaps on different scales. Um, and reflecting on Mark Phillips's comments at the opening ceremony back in the 1840s uh, and the agreed terms of trust under which the park was transferred over to Salford um, Council Corporation, although the need for refurbishment might suggest that they were not necessarily able to maintain the park in good order, as they had, as was sort of promised, uh, the park itself is still owned and managed by Salford Council and is free to use. Um, so in that sense, there's uh, some sort of degree of success in continu continuity over that period. However, it has gone undergone considerable change over that 170 or so years. Most visibly is its reduction in size. It's now approximately 10 hectares. We've gone metric, which is about 25 acres just under. Um, and it's, it's actually gained some land to the north, lost land to the south and uh, west, and is also associated with an area of land across the river called the Meadows. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's kind of grown and shrunk, but overall uh, shrunk a little. The park itself has also lost views of the river. Um, the uh, building of some rather substantial flood defences means that from the park sort of uh, flat terrace, main open areas of the park, you can no longer see the River Irwell. And the land it's lost to the south is the higher land that would have afforded those fine views. Um, <clears throat> uh, and much of that space was lost, um, is related to the construction of the university itself, initially as the Royal Technical Institute in 1896, and then later, much more uh, considerably the expansion of the University of Salford in the 1950s and 60s. So the state of the park before its refurbishment was described as follows. The expansion of the university curtailed the entire environs of the museum building and almost broke its link with the park. The park itself lost many of its features due to deterioration, new design, lack of resources and vandalism leading many locals to describe the park as out of sight, out of mind. Um, the development in the area, particularly the southern section where the university is located, meant that the heritage value of the park itself was considered to be at risk um, by the 2010s. Um, and this, so this is the context of what became the Heritage Lottery Fund application to refurbish the park largely to its 1890 layout. So you can see a restoration of the, um, the sort of formal gardens at the south, the historic core, which I'm told um, 
there's a kind of local urban legend that that is based on or inspired the FA Cup. Either way, it's apparently not true. The dates don't match up at all. But um, that's one of the local stories that people like to tell is that there's some relationship between that pattern and the FA Cup, which is some uh, tangential football trivia. So the, this application to the Heritage Lottery Fund for its refurbishment came with an updated vision for the park. And this was to create an attractive, well-used park for the 21st century living, providing a place for enjoyment, inspiration, reflection, and a source of local pride. The vision uh, goes on to talk about reintroducing historic features and re-establishing links between recreation and learning um, uh, to link the park with what's now Salford Art Gallery and Museum, which you know goes right back to some of those early talk uh, early words about uh, labelling plants in order to improve the, the labouring classes, um, but hopefully in a more enlightened fashion. And the I should say the um, Art Gallery Museum is actually just off the picture to the south here. If you followed that kind of central line down, you'd go up a set of steps and you'd be presented with the, what's now the museum building. Um, and it's actually housed in a replacement building built on the site of the former Lark Hill um, house that was the house of the estate. So uh, ultimately this uh, revised 21st century vision for the park says that it aims to put the public emphasis back and make this once again a park for the people. So in 20, the 2010s when they're preparing these documents they're very much leaning on the uh, foundations of the park from the 1840s uh, and indeed Lots of the refurbishment also included um, uh, display boards and information boards about the history of the park that are located now in the present day uh, Peel Park. Um, new audiences for the park are identified beyond or perhaps differing uh, language beyond the working class or labouring classes. Uh, for example, much more detail is known uh, about the 27,128 people who at the time lived within 1.2 kilometres of the park. We know that they are younger than elsewhere in Salford. They have a greater proportion of dependent children. Uh, there's also a significant retired population within the vicinity, and there is greater ethnic diversity than the rest of the borough. Um, some similar, so we know much more about the 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 types of people who live near the park than we did before. Uh, but there are some similarities which remain, particularly density here is higher than other parts of Salford uh, and a lack of access to gardens. Again, kind of remind taking us back to those rallying calls to working class mothers short of space and living on crowded streets. <clears throat> um, it's also noted that there's uh, relatively low use by students of the park, which is um, uh, considered a disappointment given the location of the university next door, uh, and a relatively low use by black and minority ethnic people, um, as well as disabled people. So there are new audiences and underrepresented audiences now identified in much more nuance. Um, it is noted that there is good use supported by local school aged children who visit from local schools. Um, and also uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender people, um, primarily related to a recurring event that's held in the park called the Pink Picnics. So the kind of, you know, we're, we're understanding the audience of the park very differently than we did in the 1840s. Clearly, the way we talk about and understand communities has changed and grown more detailed and nuanced. However, there are some parallels um, in the 1840s, attempts to create a democratic space, uh, and by the 2010s, this is now referred to in the, the uh, planning and, and funding application documents as creating community cohesion and activities which unite people from all walks of life. Um, so there's some similar social aspirations um, that although language change has occurred, they are still there between the 1840s and the 2010s and on funding we saw a public subscription launched to fund the park in the 1840s 
relying on large philanthropic donations, many smaller donations and some central government funding. Um, by the 2010s, we're seeing a similar blended pot of funding drawn upon. So this included the Heritage Lottery Fund, Salford City Council, Salford Community Leisure, um, and developer, direct developer contributions and the University of Salford itself. So the refurbishment of the park, we see parallels, we see them leaning back on some of that uh, founding kind of rhetoric and principles, but we also see them understand the park and its community in a different way. Um, and so to try and draw together a few thoughts, particularly around our focus on the community aspirations and funding, um, we think we can see a lot of uh, parallels despite this long history. Both periods saw formal openings, press coverage, public meetings or consultations, and a blend of finance. Um, and notably, neither were funded wholly through public money um, at either point. Both periods of time identify uh, beneficiaries and focus on the park providing local people with much needed space in the dense urban environment. Uh, and both incorporate some idea of democratic space or community cohesion. As a planner, I couldn't help but reflect on what this meant for us today and the strikingly steadfast connection between parks and community interaction. And while we don't dispute the idea that parks uh, can provide what's referred to in the literature today as convivial space. Uh, so that's spaces which um, offer kind of space for diversity to be seen and by allowing it to kind of plod along, they render such diversity uh, mundane and, and notionally generate um, at least tolerance, if not cohesion. Um, what we do know though is given the length of time this aspiration has been held and that similar aspirations were present in the 1840s, perhaps it's safe to say that the, the existence of a park is not sufficient to create community cohesion on its own. And moreover, there is a potential for parks to become a cover for underlying inequalities. While parks can contribute to these goals, we should also ensure that we acknowledge and tackle the underlying inequalities which may be driving our desire for more or improved community cohesion. So as well as looking to parks to help, we should be asking the question, what is the cause of the perceived incohesion or incoherence uh, so that we don't allow parks to become a cover? Um, in order to do this, we think we need to take account of also park quality and maintenance. And we know that by the 2010s, uh, the maintenance of the park was considered poor and that park quality is one of the ways in which um, different communities in different parts of the country experience inequality. Access to high quality, well-maintained parks is not evenly geographically spread. Um, and despite the recognition of the value of public parks for the public good in both periods, neither provided sufficient public funding to enable their existence and their maintenance. If we focus on the contemporary finance blend, we see a reinvention of the public subscription, this time through the National Lottery. Um, and perhaps this also brings problems, particularly as we know that lotteries are known to collect disproportionately from the less well-off areas and that they don't contain the same local guarantees or geographic guarantees that those communities themselves will benefit from their charitable giving. Uh, although they often, they often do, but it's not explicit and um, unlike in the 1840s where the local subscription drew very much on the local um, beneficiaries moreover the introduction of the heritage lottery fund introduces a set of specific goals of that funder onto the goals of the community um, and in and those two sets of goals two sets of priorities may not always align um, in this case the heritage lottery fund requires that projects consider community and heritage as part of their bids. Um, and so although these particular goals may be relatively benign, there is the potential for this model to offer an introduction point for other uh, goals through future 
uh, philanthropic or developer contributions and funders. So we argue that it's the funding of Peel Park offers an example of what we might term entrepreneurial municipalism, um, and perhaps two examples over a hundred years apart, um, with both experiencing not enough government funding available, both here as sought other options. And again, to focus on today, that shows how through entrepreneurialism, local councils are able to pull together funding from multiple sources. Although we should remember that that process can come with this collection of conditions or goals imposed um, as conditions of the funding. So there are potential downsides to the entrepreneurialism. What we think this history emphasizes when reflected on today is that while our desire for parks has remained, and we've grown perhaps even more aware of the importance of green spaces, particularly in the last 18 months, even creating new terminology to demonstrate all that it offers us as planners creating green infrastructure, we are still underfunding public park provision and maintenance. The financing of Peel Park refurbishment through the Heritage Lottery Fund, which is um, uh, hypothecated or ring fenced as a non-essential fund for non-essential work. When you put that alongside the status of public park provision as a non-statutory duty for local authorities, we see the emphasis of this conditional value placed on public parks. So parks are important, but not essential. This status drives the need for other funding sources with the possible introduction and imposition of external conditions that that may entail. This may or may not align with the 170 plus year mission of the public park. And I certainly will be looking uh, at, with close interest as Salford's development pressure continues to squeeze the park uh, with kind of, I guess, bated breath about whether or not some of those new funding opportunities may impose new conditions. And um, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sam, for a really interesting kind of presentation, which has taken us from the from the origins of the, of the park and the, the issues and concerns at the time to um, its kind of rebirth, I suppose, a few years ago. It's very interesting to, to try and think about uh, how similar some of those concerns Ah, so it's at this stage when it's it's wonderful to see if we've got some questions and can get a bit of a discussion going. Um, I'm can only as we've got the screen that the slide. Stop I, sharing. It, it, well, if we can, um, if maybe we can put it up later. Yeah. Um, if people want to to grab to grab that, if you can stop sharing, that will that will let me have a a sight of, of who we've got now. Um, what we've done as well, for those of you who are familiar um, with doing questions on Zoom, is invite people if they want to, either to put the question in the chat, if they if they aren't able to um, speak the question, if people haven't got the, the um, voice facility, and I'll keep an eye on the chat, or either show me, wave your hand or put your little hand reaction up and then I'll invite you to ask um, a question. Okay, so we've got a comment in there uh, from Susan, yes, about the issues to do with future funding, thank you. Christine, did you have a question? Um, yes, I'm interested in control back in the 1840s, which obviously presumably was very much council led. And today, um, given the funding of parks and indeed even statutory um, requirements like libraries, a lot, a, lot of, a lot of volunteers are very involved in what's going on to a certain extent. I mean, most of the parks I go to, a lot of the gardening, for example, is done by um, volunteers and friends of whatever park play a crucial role. I'm just wondering, do you think they would have much of a say over how the parks develop now? Presumably it would be a better situation than the 1840s. Yeah, certainly. So um, actually thinking back to the um, the park superintendent reports that I was looking at from the 1880s, 
they talk a lot about uh, the labour force and the number of people employed is significantly higher. <laughs> they have dozens of uh, men over several years digging and building the, uh, the flood defences, for example, or repainting benches. So, um, but it's all, yeah, through the council. And in fact, there were examples from the 1880s of requests from the superintendent for uh, sort of sick pay, if you like, for, for well, two men, one who was uh, taken ill at work and was removed to the Salford Royal Infirmary, <laughs> and, uh, and they agreed to pay half his salary. And another man who's ill and can't, commit, uh, can't uh, complete his duties. Um, and I actually didn't, I didn't find their follow-up response from, the, from the, the council to see whether they uh, agreed to pay half his salary or not. So yes, uh, in terms of that, very much council-led, um, and there, there are bodies uh, on hand to do work. Although it is quite, there are lots of requests for money and for extra bits and for extra benches or for extra hurdles to keep the sheep in or, or whatnot. So I don't think they were swimming in cash. Um, but then, yeah, to your point, in terms of the contemporaries are very much friends of Park. Uh, in Peel Park is very active. Um, what they are, they have benefited from, Salford has uh, sort of semi outsourced its some of its community functions. So its libraries and art gallery is actually run by uh, what they call, uh, let's think, how do we describe it? It's a social enterprise that is an, a spin out from the council called Soulful Community Leisure. That runs their leisure facilities, libraries, and the museum. It doesn't run their parks. They still have that in house. So they have a small park ranger team in Salford Council. I think it's only three or four people and they manage all the parks in Salford. Uh, and through the Heritage Lottery Fund application, one aspect of that fund was to fund the position of a permanent Peel Park Ranger um, for five years. Uh, so that post actually may, may well be coming to an end in the next year or so, I think, um, unless they've found new funding to secure that post. So. The Heritage Lottery Fund provided a boost in terms of another body who's permanently located at Peel Park. And the contribution of the university was actually to provide uh, a warden's base. In, I mean, it's the least they could do given their buildings are now built on top of the park. But the basement of one of their buildings now houses the warden um, kind of tea room and, and equipment store. Um, so, there, so there is, uh, that kind of continuation, although much shrunk, and now funded through these kind of like periodic pots of money. And the Friends of group is really important. They do lots of volunteering and um, time in terms of maintenance and litter picking. Um, and a lot of that is done through kind of yeah, community action groups and things um, uh, rather than through uh, the employed time of the, of the wardens and rangers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else? Could I um, ask one now? I just wondered, following on from what you said about uh, that, that kind of general idea that a park would be um, a very important facility for the local population. And you did mention, didn't you, morals and morale, as it were, the, the expectation that the provision of this green space would would be of positive benefit. I wondered if if the if that was always the case, or whether there were at any times any concerns about people's behaviour in oh. the park. <laughs> Very much so. Actually, another the the superintendent's reports are absolute goldmine because they've got really detailed accounts of kind of the the day to day events of the park. But so they were a bit later from when it first opened. Um, Although I think some of the opening reports also talk of um, their desire to make sure, because I think they were aware or <laughs> had assumed that, um, you know, for a lot of people, this experience would be new to visit such a park and to see it laid out with some of the, 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 the planting, particularly as it developed. Um, so there was a lot of talk of uh, how to manage where people walked um, and to, make sure people didn't walk through planting and flower beds and things. Um, so I guess the sort of very early 
keep off the glass sort of mentality developing. Um, but in the superintendent's reports, there are also some reports of various um, kind of police interactions where they uh, kind of are called to remove a disturbance, a drunk man, um, for example. Um, and actually, I suppose that same kind of antisocial behaviour, as we would call it now, continues in some of the reports and the analysis of what was wrong with the park in the 2010s. Um, particularly some of the reasons the students, for example, used to say they kind of didn't visit or wouldn't visit um, were because of their feelings of antisocial behaviour and the lack of sort of feelings of safety in the park. Um, and so they that was kind of one of the key aspects that they wanted to improve in the refurbishment um, and led to them well re a kind of re-establishing proper path network in the park but also thinning out they took out quite a lot of trees as part of the refurbishment partly to restore some of the open areas and that were present in the 1890 plan but also um, to kind of restore sight lines and kind of increase natural surveillance and feelings of safety in the park. Um, so definitely, and there are some quite colourful examples of, um, particularly from the 1880s, of people being um, reprimanded and, and ex expelled from the park. Um, yeah. Lovely. So it looks like it was everything from just people needing to be reminded where to yeah. walk to some really kind of behaviour that would, you know, make other people feel uncomfortable in the park. I, I also wondered if, if, if there'd ever been any issues with people trying to cut flowers or kind of remove any of the plants. You know, I, I don't know, although I think, I wonder if um, a colleague at Salford wrote a really nice book that includes a, a, a more detailed account of some of the history of Peel Park. And I, I wonder if she's got some of those accounts of some of that more day-to-day -day stuff. I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, I suspect there was. But I don't yeah, know. I, I know someone who volunteers at a National Trust property who says that can be an issue, that they do find people coming in with the equipment ready to go, you know, a little trowel and a bag and yeah. help themselves. Wonderful. We've had a question that's that's coming on the on the chat. Um, you've just uh, mentioned flood defences. Uh, how often has the park flooded and, and who was and is responsible for reinstatement works when this occurs? Um, that's a really good test because I, I should know because there's an enormous great big monument in the park to two very particular floods. <laughs> I can't remember the dates of either. Um, oh gosh. Yeah, I think there's one in the 1870s, a big flood. Um, and that there's a, a kind of cenotaph. Uh, or what would you call it, uh, no, like a needle, to mark uh, the height of that flood. Um, and that's, and, I mean, enormous. Uh, it was, I guess, from ground level, it's way above your head, so it's eight or nine feet um, covering the park, which today would cover all of the usable area of the park, effectively, because it's uh, all that's left of the park space proper is this sort of river level uh, open spaces. All of the high ground is now built on as part of the university. Um, so, and what they did, and this actually is also again in the, in the uh, superintendent's works, is that they began construction after the 1870 flood of this flood defence. Um, and I think that's been, you know, expanded, maintained, modernised over the time. And it, today it's, uh, I mean, they spent years digging it and building it by hand. Um, and there were requests for more men and labour to kind of complete the project. And then the final sign off several years later. Um, I think it's, there is then a, a report of a second flood that, Floods Salford, but doesn't overtop those flood defences, if, if my memory serves, I think. So the park itself is saved from that other major flood. Um, and then that flood defence is maintained. Today, it's a big kind of earth bund with a um, cycle path and walkway along the top and benches. So you can walk along there and that's where you would get your river views because from the park itself now you you can't see the river because of the flood defense 
um, I guess sort of leaping ahead then, Salford is still impacted by flooding, the River Irwell still, um, and most recently, well, I want to say the Boxing Day floods were 2015, I think. Um, and again, Peel Park is saved because the flood defences are high enough, but the neighbouring area across the river and a bit to the north, um, oh gosh, whose name completely escapes me, Broughton was flooded on Boxing Day. Um, and actually, so Peel Park now forms Salford's largest area of, it's part of the largest area of green space in Salford. And it basically extends from Peel Park and the meadows at the river meander all the way up the river with little breaks where there were bridges and, and a small housing estate. But broadly speaking, there's a big green sort of sward that goes up across some playing fields and up to the new flood defence. Uh, it's a kind of engineered uh, wetland that takes the overflow water of the River Irwell during the flood event. And that was constructed post 2015 in response and now has continued to protect both the park, Central Salford and Broughton uh, in more recent flood events. So flooding is very much a theme of that area of Salford throughout the whole period. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, would anybody else like to, to ask a question? Well, can I thank you, Sam, again for your paper, which has shed some uh, some wonderful light on on that. It's an area of, of the northwest I don't know myself very well. I must admit, I've I've spent most of my time since I've moved from Sheffield to to be in Liverpool. Um, it would be wonderful to see that image up again, if if it's possible to put that back. And um, you've got the the web address, haven't you, for for further information? Um, but it's been wonderful to hear. Um, and to reflect, I think, on how many of the issues um, that the uh, the people uh, were, were kind of considering and and um, contemplating in the in the eighteen forties, and how they went about actually financing the park, crop up again, um, and that yeah. there are very often very similar uh, responses, not identical, but often broadly similar responses. Um, and as our contribution um, came through earlier. Um, Yes, we hope that there will be decent ongoing funding for the parks. We hope for that here in, in Liverpool uh, as yeah. well, very, very much so. So um, we've got there the web address for uh, the, the paper that people can have a look at, the, the DOI address there, and interesting things that are going on in, in Peel Park, if you want to get over there and, and uh, run or walk and enjoy the park there, and Sam's uh, Twitter address as well. Sam, thank you very much on behalf of the Society. It's been wonderful uh, listening to the paper today. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. And I think Arlene will come on, but our next event... Yeah. <laughs> he's hoping Arlene is now going to interrupt because he can't remember. I can remember the event, our next event, which is... Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, my my um, sound went very peculiar in the middle of the lecture. Sorry about that. Um, the next, our next Zoom lecture, we are going to try a Saturday afternoon. And so it's going to be on Saturday, the 20th of November, 2 p.m., when it's Professor Keith Lilly, who is going to talk on the historic and historical mapping of Chester. So do please go to Eventbrite and get your tickets. And uh, thank you very much, everybody, for coming to hear Sam's lecture, which I absolutely thoroughly enjoyed. Um, and as I live actually on the actual edge of Sefton Park, um, and I know how lucky we are in Liverpool. I mean, very much, um, yeah. Sefton. Uh, it's, uh, thank you very much, Sam. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all, and see you next month, Sam. See you soon. I'll, I'll email later. <laughs>